We previously proved the fundamental homomorphism theorem, link in the description to that video. This theorem tells us that any homomorphic image H of any group G is necessarily isomorphic to the quotient group of G by the kernel of the homomorphism which takes us on to that homomorphic image. The converse is true as well, every quotient group is isomorphic to a homomorphic image. And now that we know why this theorem is true, let's look at a couple of examples of applying it. We'll see a group, a homomorphic image, a kernel of the homomorphism and apply the fundamental homomorphism theorem to see what isomorphism is forced. Let's begin with a simple example taking us from Z6 to Z3. This function here is a homomorphism from Z6 to Z3. It's easy to see that it's surjective. It maps 0 to 0, 1 to 1, and 2 to 2, so all of Z3 has been covered. It also maps 3 to 0, 4 to 1, and 5 to 2. Now this is surjective, and it is a homomorphism, which is easy to verify. Just as an example, 2 plus 3 is 5, and the image of 5 is 2. On the other hand, the image of 2 is 2 and the image of 3 is 0, and those also add to 2. This does preserve the group operation. So Z3 is a homomorphic image of Z6, and this is our homomorphism. Where we have a homomorphic image, we can apply the fundamental homomorphism theorem, but it's important that we identify the kernel. The kernel is the set of elements that the homomorphism takes to the identity. We see that is 0, which it maps to the identity and 3, which it also maps to the identity. So the kernel of this homomorphism is the set containing 0 and 3, which happens to be the cyclic subgroup generated by 3. This is a normal subgroup of the domain Z6. And so we can apply the theorem. This notation, which we introduced in the previous lecture, says that F is a homomorphism mapping Z6 onto Z3 with the cyclic subgroup generated by 3 as its kernel. And so, applying the fundamental homomorphism theorem, we have that Z3 is isomorphic to the quotient group of Z6 by the cyclic subgroup generated by 3. We're going to come back to this example at the end and construct the group tables, but first let's look at another quirky example. This is an abusive notation, but in this example we're roughly going to show that g times h divided by g is equal to h. Kind of a cute result. Let's go through the details so you know exactly what I mean. Let g and h be groups. You may recall that this is a group called the direct product of g and h. It contains all ordered pairs x, y, where x ranges over the group g and y ranges over the group h. The way we combine two ordered pairs from the direct product is by multiplying corresponding components with their appropriate group operations. That is, a, b times the ordered pair c, d is this ordered pair. a times c, those are being multiplied with the group operation in g and BD is the second component, where those are being multiplied under the operation from H. The group H is actually a homomorphic image of the direct product of G with H, which this homomorphism F verifies. This homomorphism maps each ordered pair XY onto its second component, which is in the group H. It's trivial to see that this is surjective. Every element of H definitely gets hit by this homomorphism, and it certainly preserves the group operation if we were to compose two of these ordered pairs from the direct product, the second component would just be the composition of those two elements from H, and so it would get mapped to the composition of those two elements from H. If we put the ordered pairs from the direct product through the homomorphism first and then combine the resulting elements, it's clear that we would get the same thing. Doing it this way, one ordered pair gets mapped to Y1, the other one gets mapped to Y2, and then of course they would be composed and we would get Y1, Y2. So this is a homomorphism from the direct product onto H, and it's important that we identify its kernel, the set of all elements which it maps to H's identity. Let's say H's identity is E. Then any ordered pair of the form X, E 
is going to be mapped to E, the identity in H. So all of those ordered pairs make up the kernel. So there's our kernel consisting of all those ordered pairs X, E, where E is the identity of H, and X can be any element from G we like. We're going to call this kernel G star. Hopefully you can see that it pretty much just is the group G, except each element is an ordered pair that has this identity of H tacked onto it. But the first component, those are just all of the elements of G. The second component is just that fixed identity of H. So it's just like G, except it's all these ordered pairs. We're going to call it G star. So then we've got this homomorphism F mapping the direct product of G with H onto H with a kernel of G star. And so we can apply the fundamental homomorphism theorem to conclude that this homomorphic image H is isomorphic to the quotient group of the direct product by G star. And like we said, G star is basically just G. It's just a bunch of ordered pairs containing those elements of G as well as the identity of H. And so roughly speaking, we have that G times H by G is isomorphic to H. This is Q, of course, because it resembles familiar behavior with real numbers, but I do want to again reiterate it is an abusive notation. This doesn't actually mean anything. Because G isn't a normal subgroup of the direct product, G just contains individual elements while the direct product contains ordered pairs, so G is definitely not a normal subgroup, so this technically does not have any meaning. But hopefully you get the spirit of what we're going for with this example. All right, let's come back to that first straightforward example with Z6 and Z3 and look at the group tables so we can really see that isomorphism in action, really see that they have the same structure. It's important that we identify the elements of these groups in order to construct the group table. Z3, of course, contains 0, 1, and 2, and the quotient group of Z6 by the cyclic group generated by 3 contains all of the cosets of the cyclic subgroup generated by 3. So the plus 0, the plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, and plus 5. All of those cosets. So then it's a little overwhelming, but here's the group table for the quotient group. For example, if we combine the plus 2 element with the plus 3 element, we're going to get the plus 5 element. If we combine the plus 4 coset with the plus 5 coset, that's the same as the plus 9 coset, but mod 6, that's the plus 3 coset. Now you should know that the group table for Z3 is going to look a lot smaller than this, so if in fact they are isomorphic, there must be some redundant information in this group table. And it will be easier to see that redundant information if we write these cosets in roster form. Doing that, we get this group table, so each coset has just been replaced by what it actually is in roster notation. And now we see all sorts of redundancies because, for example, the cyclic subgroup generated by 3 plus 4 and the cyclic subgroup generated by 3 plus 1, those are the same. They're both just sets containing 1 and 4. Also, the plus 0 coset and the plus 3 coset are the same. They're both just the sets containing 3 and 0. So we're going to eliminate all of the redundant information. We don't need the cyclic subgroup generated by 3 plus 3 because that's the same as the cyclic subgroup generated by 3 plus 0. And of course, all the other similar redundancies we will eliminate as well. All right, so removing redundancies, we get this much nicer group table, which we can then put back into its coset form, just because that's going to help us see the isomorphism. This is the 3 by 3 table, excluding all of the redundancies, and that's with all of those cosets written back in. And at this point, it's clear to see how this will be isomorphic to Z3. There is our group table for Z3, and the isomorphism between these things is pretty obvious. 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1. The fundamental homomorphism theorem has not failed us. But that's a look at a couple of examples of applying the fundamental homomorphism theorem. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my abstract algebra course and abstract algebra exercises playlists in the description for more. If you find my videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to additional videos and practice, and if you join at the premium tier or above, you can access the lecture notes used in my courses. Thanks for watching. Audio.